Welcome to Live from Plato's Cave. I am Mario V. This is episode 32, Climate Science Rebellion with Ernst Jan Kuiper. A couple of episodes ago, we already spoke about the idea that Socrates was an activist. He displayed a philosophical practice called paresia, which means telling the truth, no matter what the social norms and conventions are or what the consequences of your actions are. One of my favorite tweets of all time is by the climate scientist Bill McKibben. It says, when scientists protest, their picket signs have footnotes. It shows climate scientist Kimberly Nicholas' picket sign with the five basic facts of climate scientists and of course some footnotes. Those facts again are, it's warming, it's us, it's bad, we're sure, and we can fix it. I think it's safe to say that a society is in trouble when its scientists take to the streets. It's even more in trouble when, like the day before I recorded this interview, scientists block those streets and intentionally break the law. Because after publishing research papers, doing petitions and marches, they now believe it is the only way to call our attention to the science. Saturday 11th of March 2023 saw scientists pasting research papers to water cannons of the police in The Hague. The police later used these same water cannons against these about 80 scientists and thousands of other citizens that were present. All of the Extinction Rebellion and Scientist Rebellion protesters were there peacefully, and yet the government used violence against them. Chris Julian, who I interviewed in episode 26, was hit in the face by the police while he was lying on the ground. You can hear an update from him at the end of this episode. My guest today is climate scientist Ernst Jan Kuiper. In 2014, Ernst Jan obtained his master's degree in climate physics, after which he focused on research into the dynamics of the Greenland ice sheet. After five years, including six weeks of fieldwork on the Greenland ice sheet, he obtained his doctorate in 2019. Ernst Jan is currently working at Milieu Defensie on the appeal against oil giant Shell. He also writes articles about climate change for the Dutch program Tegenlicht and gives lectures about climate change. He also spends time on climate activism, especially with Extinction Rebellion. And the day before we recorded this interview, he was there too. And later he was arrested with about 700 other protesters. I asked him to explain the climate science that is so worrying that he takes to the streets to tell the truth about climate science and to ring the alarm bell. And also about the fact that he, as a scientist, still has hope that we can do something against climate change. And I also want to know why, as a climate scientist, he sees the court case of Milieu Defensie against Shell as the most impactful thing that he could be working on right now. I had a few guests now on this podcast, and uh, some had like, uh, uh, if if I agreed on a date for an interview, they had, uh, how do you say that, some uncertainty, sometimes even climate related, like uh, uh, one of my guests, uh, she there was a huge storm there in uh, in California, so she wasn't sure if how that would go and if she would have an internet connection. But I have to say, I never had the kind of contingency that you had, so... Yeah, just uh, as a first question, what does a climate scientist do on an everyday Saturday? On an everyday Saturday, normally I play football or soccer for the Americans. Yeah. Um, But uh, yesterday was definitely not an ordinary Saturday, uh, at least not for me. Quite a big uh, climate protest in the Netherlands, in The Hague. And uh, it started at at about noon. Um, And it's a protest against the fossil fuel subsidies that the government is still handing out uh, each and every year. We don't know the exact size of the fossil fuel subsidies, but but independent researchers say it's it's roughly 15 billion a year. That's that's with a B, billion Mm -hmm. uh, euros a year. Uh, That's mostly in tax breaks. By the way, it's not direct subsidies, but it's in tax breaks. And our government, our prime minister actually, promised to stop the subsidies in 2013. Yeah, that was at the climate uh, conference. He said, uh, action, action, action. Action, action, action. I guess guess you listened to him with the action, action, action. Yeah, exactly, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, 
So but we're in the middle of a climate crisis and we're still subsidizing the industry that is, first of all, incredibly rich and wealthy and profitable. Uh, but but second of all, it's just, you know, pushing us over the edge within a decade or two. It's just insanity. And 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 it's not just us scientists that are saying this. It's, it's actually the, the government itself that has promised it over and over again that they would end the fossil fuel subsidies and they simply refuse to do so. Um, so yeah, what, what, what measures, what, what options are left after asking politely for, for year after year, then you hit the streets, right? I mean, that's, that's the next step, I guess. Um, and yesterday, uh, on Saturday was, the, I think the sixth protest against these fossil fuel subsidies. And we tried to block, uh, one street in the middle of the Hague, which is, um, in between the building of the parliament and the ministry of economic affairs and climate oh that seems relevant yeah exactly it's a very symbolic place and we try to block that uh it's actually the 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 ending of a highway so the highway ends like in the middle of the city and i think the speed limit is 50 or 70 kilometers an hour it it doesn't matter but it's a very symbolic place and we try to block it until well either the police removes us or the fossil fuel subsidies have have been cancelled. Well, I, I want to speak about this a little bit later because I call myself an existential journalist, which is like a philosophical journalist, and I'm kind of reporting on the the absurdity and the insanity yeah, yeah. Of, of, of Plato's cave. And there were some elements yesterday that I'm looking forward to discuss with you because they were just so absurd. But I mean, I guess it's a sign of the times when you invite a, a scientist on a podcast and the scientist says well uh, probably i can do it sunday unless i'm in jail <laughs> yeah i i just realized that I, I didn't even answer your question so indeed what i answered to to i think a few weeks ago was that we can do it uh, on this day on this sunday except for the case when i'm in jail yeah um because sometimes the police keeps you overnight uh for whatever reason um, that up until this day has never happened to me. I'm, I'm quite lucky in that sense. Uh, but yeah, I, I could But you were in jail. I was in jail. Um, yeah, but it was my sh my shortest time in jail ever. It was, I oh, think, okay. Congratulations. Minutes or so. <laughs> yeah, thanks. They were very efficient and they just wanted to, to get us out of jail. So, yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. so they took my identity and then they threw me out more or less immediately, mm -hmm. um, which was good because I was quite cold as well. Why were you cold? Well, so... Uh, Protest started at, at noon, um, and the first couple of hours were actually quite relaxed. It, it was almost like, well, I'm not saying a festival kind of atmosphere, but it was really calm and peaceful, and there were, mu there were musicians um, until about 5, 5.15 p.m., uh, when the police actually, you know, started threatening, you know, we're going to arrest you, you can't stay here anymore, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and all this time, there were two water cannons um, from Germany, actually, because it said Polizei, uh, which is the okay. German word for, for police, were standing there next to a protest. Um, I thought, naively or not, that, that it was just to threaten us. Um, but at a certain point, I think at about 5.15 or so, uh, they actually started using them, the water cannons, which was kind of... I'm struggling to find the words. I, I I never expected the Dutch government to do this actually, to use water cannons in just above freezing temperatures because it, it was quite cold. And at about 5 p.m. The, the sun started to set. So it was actually quite cold as well. So what it comes down to is that they're using just, you know, freezing tactics. That's that's or whatever you, you would like to call okay, it. Okay, so they, they spray you with the water cannon. You sit there in a group on, on the on the road, right? You get very yeah, wet exactly. in the cold temperatures. So, yeah, yeah. that's, uh, you know, not nice for your health, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And and I, I read in the news that four people actually passed out uh, from the cold. Um, yeah. They are okay now, but it, it, it shows the extent to which the government is, is, is going to basically to to in order to protect the status quo or in this case the fossil fuel subsidies but but were you provoking the police or something did you no, throw bricks at not. them or no, we, what, what were you doing 
we have a lot of rules, but if but the most the most important one is that we stay non-violent all the time. That that's that's not even up for debate or discussion or 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 whatever. So basically, we were just refusing to leave uh, until the government would do what it had promised over and over again, which is end fossil fuel subsidies. And that's a fair demand, I would say. So yeah, at a certain point, the police, well, they they threatened to arrest us from twelve. 15 or whatever but at after five they actually started doing it but we were with so many it was a couple of thousand that the police had just no capacity to actually arrest all of us they, they simply cannot process that many people so i assume that their tactic was you know just to blow us away and just just you know make sure we would leave semi-voluntarily by just you know basically freezing us there were a lot of scientists and academics there and they sp stuck research papers to water cannons and well that's that's quite crazy <laughs> yeah yeah it, that actually wasn't me but i i i mean the protest was so big i didn't even know yeah this uh i definitely would have joined because it's i think it's it's very symbolic you know you you can blow us away with uh with a thousand liters of uh, of cold water but the science stays, you know, and, and these papers, I'm not sure if you've actually seen them, but, you know, they're climate scientific papers warning yeah. us. Yeah, uh, saying that or, we have to act yeah. now to stay be, exactly. uh, under one and a half degrees. Yeah, 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 exactly. And that's one of the reasons, I think even the main reason why I decided to join Scientist Rebellion. So the protest yesterday was from Extinction Rebellion, but there's there's like a few dozen sub subgroups. Uh, and one of them is Scientist Rebellion. And I think it gives just a very powerful image um, that uh, scientists are actually, you know, hitting the streets now, um, basically out of desperation. You know, I mean, how many papers do you have to write? How how many talks do you have to give before, you know, the, the government actually starts to listen? Um, so that and, and we, we actually wear these white lab coats um uh while we're in the protest so you know it's it's you can actually see that you know we are scientists um when you say scientists you mean well i want to get into your history but in general so people working at academic institutions like yeah yeah exactly uh so yeah basically yeah so our um basically only demand is that you should have a phd or you should be working on your phd um, so in my okay. case, I left, yeah. I left, I left, uh, I left academia a few years ago. So all the scientists rebellions, people at the protest yesterday, they either were working on their PhD or they had their PhD. Yeah. And how, how many, do you have an estimate of how many in the Netherlands are part of the scientist rebellion? Uh, yesterday we were with 81 that were actually in the protest, but yeah, it's, it's in the lower hundreds. I, I would say that of, of the, like the total scientists that are somehow joining. And this has increased quite a lot actually, because I remember I joined Extinction Rebellion in 2000, in the beginning of 2019, it was the last few months I was in academia and I actually tried to start a subgroup or um of i think we tried to call it a scientist for extinction rebellion or something like that but we were with five and and we were just too busy with other stuff and eventually well the whole thing collapsed and now wind forward a few years and we're with 81 and growing quite fast actually because half a year ago we were with i don't know 20 or so so you know it's this exponential growth yeah, and 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 it's it's getting more accepted within the scientific community as well. It's not just that more people or more academics are joining, but it's also that it's it's more broadly accepted now than a few years ago. Well, yeah, more broadly, but not, for instance, at the institution where I work. I even in this interview, I have to be very careful about what I say and what I don't say. But uh, so, and actually, I don't want to say more about it than this, but uh, it's, I it's imagine, strange I not to imagine. mention it. Okay. But let's talk about you because you're a climate scientist. Yeah. That means you did a master's degree in climate science or was that more general? Yeah, I did my bachelor's in earth sciences or geology. When was that? Oh, I started in 2007. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And I finished the bachelor, but I liked it but not that much and then 
Uh, in my bachelor, I followed a couple of courses in climate science, which was actually at the Department of Physics, uh, which I like way more. So um, after I finished my bachelor in 2010 or 11, I think, um, I switched from uh, geology to uh, climate physics. That's that's what the master is called, um, climate physics. Uh, and it's a two-year master's, uh, which I finished in 2014, I think. And then I decided to do a PhD or at least to apply for a PhD and I got one. And and before you did those courses in climate science, were you interested in climate? A, a little bit. I mean, I, I do remember watching Al Gore's... Inconvenient Truth. Yeah, in 2006, I think it was. I mean, a long time ago when I was actually still in high school, I think. And I remember being impressed about it and, and being alarmed but then a few weeks later i forgot about it like i think 99 percent of the people so yeah i've always been interested in nature but not to the extent that i'm now <laughs> obviously i i just loved my master i think the, from a scientific perspective the climate system is very interesting we've been studying it for only a few decades basically, or at least at academic scale. So there's still a lot of stuff that we need to figure out. And uh, it's a very chaotic system as well. Yeah, that, uh, that's what I really, uh, I mean, I try to study different sciences, but geology was because geology has kind of an image, right? I mean, it's changing now, but kind of an image of, of not very exciting science. But for me, it changed <laughs> when I, I read Marcia Björnerud's book, Timefulness and uh, reading the rocks, uh, like a kind of a overview of the earth's history and uh, i interviewed her like twice i think for this podcast as well okay but one of the things that surprised me is that something like the tectonic plates yeah for me that seems like wow that's as old uh, that's at least a couple of hundred years we have known about that but that was what in the in the 60s or 70s or something yeah exactly right? exactly and that's yeah. a quite fundamental fact about the planet that we're living on Oh yeah, it's like it's like the evolutionary theory of geology. You know, yeah. it, it basically explains. Or without it, you cannot explain anything, or at least not on on the large scale. Um, yeah, definitely. And and I think climate science is even younger. I mean, we've known about the greenhouse effect since uh, 1900, but to if we like studying it on like an academic level and and you know having more than a few scientist involved is is only a few decades basically so yeah so, so so i loved that part of my studies definitely and uh yeah as i said i i decided to apply for phd and i got one and i uh studied um ice dynamics within the greenland ice sheet so i i won't talk about it too long because it's quite technical and, and detailed but it, it basically comes down to how do I explain this in a few sentences? So if snow falls on the Greenland ice sheet, uh, it falls obviously on top of the Greenland ice sheet. It compacts after a while and then it flows towards the edges of the ice sheets and there it either melts away or uh, or is dropped into the ocean. That's like the, the natural cycle of an, of, uh, of an ice sheet. Um, and the way and the speed at which this ice is flowing within the ice sheet, that was the topic of my research. Why is that relevant? Ultimately, the European Union wants to know how much sea level is going to rise. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore, we need to understand both the Greenland and the uh, Antarctic ice sheet. Um, so that's where the funding was coming from. But um, yeah, so to to describe these, these flows, we use flow laws, which are basically mathematical equations. And we know that the flow laws for ice that we have are not working very well, but we don't have anything else. So goal of the research was to come up with a better flow law uh, that describes the ice flow within an ice sheet model because you you have to put this stuff into a climate model. I, I hope I explained this. Yeah, for sure. You know, I follow. I mean, ultimately, you want to know how much of the ice that falls there is going to end up in the ocean. Exactly. Uh, trying uh, getting the sea levels to rise. But yeah. in order to know that, you have to know like kind of the behavior of, of ice. Like how does it flow? When does it freeze? When does it? Exactly. That, that's one of the insights I got from speaking with Marcia that, that uh, I have these conceptions about what is fluid and what is solid. But like rocks can be fluid, and and yeah. there's all these there's all this motion happening on in inside the earth, in the atmosphere, of course, with gases, but also 
yeah, uh, eyes and everything that that everything is moving basically, right? Yeah. So you're studying yeah. how it, how it's moving, but the laws that that's not not extremely well understood yet. But it's quite exactly. urgent to figure that out because we yeah. in the Netherlands, I I'm in Gouda right now. I think I'm like a couple of meters be- below sea level. So yeah, no, yeah, that it's 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 actually quite correct what you're saying because the we always said that ice is the warmest rock on the planet. Oh wow! Because um, ice actually is a rock; it behaves like a rock, and it it is a rock. And with the warmest, we mean it's closest to its melting point, because it's just a couple of degrees below its melting point, and therefore it moves relatively easily. Uh, you know, if you have a jar of peanut butter, if it's freezing, it's basically solid. But the if it gets closer to its melting point, it it starts to what we call deform. It's 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 not flowing; it's deformation. Um, so yeah, what you're saying is absolutely correct. Ice is basically a rock. It's just very close to its melting point, and that's why it's flowing relatively fast compared to uh, the rocks inside Earth. But yeah, so anyway, uh, I I did my research for five years. I also did a very short postdoc afterwards. Um, but it all came down to the fact that well, for, uh, first I did uh, I did a master in climate physics. I think it was two and a half years. And then I, I, I studied the Greenland Ice Sheet for five years, reading papers on a daily basis uh, about, you know, uh, how fast the Greenland Ice Sheet is melting and how much sea level rise that is going to cause. So after a while, you, 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 you cannot deny this stuff anymore. And, you know, it's in your face each and every day. So I guess there's always some uncertainty with regards to like, is it going to be like half a centimeter more or less? But yeah. in general, we have a pretty clear picture of, of what yeah, we can exactly. expect. Yeah, we, we have a relatively good idea what's coming in the long term in terms of sea level rise, but we don't know at what speed it's coming. Because um, the the speed at which the planet is heating up now is simply un- unprecedented. Uh, in the geological history um and we just don't know how fast these ice sheets will respond to the warming that we are causing um so we know that we'll get uh well there's actually still quite a bit uncertainty but we know we get a couple of meters per degree of warming um some it, the best estimate is about two is about two and a half meters per degree but that's in the long term and in the short term the uncertainty is quite quite big actually um so just just to give an order of magnitude idea uh, at the end of the century so in the year 2100 uh best case scenario where we both are lucky with uh how fast the ice sheets are responding and we have actually some proper climate policies we l- we're looking at tens of centimeters um of sea level rise at the end of the century uh so 30 40 50 60 centimeters um if we're both unlucky and our climate policy is is still as bad as it is, as it is today um then we're looking at at a few meters um and this and this this difference in, in increases in time you know in 2200 we could be looking at at multiple meters um and so yeah and you said you live in Gouda a few meters below sea level well at at the moment we can handle that obviously you're still sitting there and your your house is dry etc but there will be a time that we cannot handle this anymore um and we probably get in we probably run into trouble at the end of the century at least in the netherlands that's what i'm talking about right yeah right now and we're we live in a very rich and privileged country with lots of resources and everything like exactly. that so exactly if if i have to worry about that it means that by that time i mean or well we already saw what happened last year in in pakistan and india yeah and, and exactly in different places yeah exactly exactly these are the countries that cannot defend them themselves to basically to the climate change that we have caused um and not them but um so uh yeah so the i often say to people that it's not a matter if the netherlands is gonna flood but when you know and and um and it's also you know the the lowest part of the netherlands is also the most densely populated one and it's where all the economic activity is or at least most of it etc et so in the long term this will be very problematic and and not just for the netherlands obviously but uh and how 
how um, many of your colleagues would agree or disagree with you if you if you make a statement like that i mean to trying to get a sense because there are many uh, I, I know for instance in physics them them let's say theoretical physics there are different uh, theories right and we don't really know uh, i'm just going to say uh, hogwash now but like the 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 Higgs boson yeah, or yeah. or the weight of it or whether is there some supersymmetry or not so there's like a lot of of course, in science, there's a lot of uncertainty and then people disagree yeah. with each other. And, and so how much would you say if, if you make statements like that? Are there a lot of colleagues that would maybe say, no, uh, Ernst Jan, that's not true. I uh, I have a different theory. Oh, uh, n- n- very, very few. Let let me tell you, it's, it's, it's hard to, to put a number on, but let, let me just say, so you obviously know the IPC report, you know, it's the... It's the biggest, arguably the, the the biggest scientific report ever. But but it's uh, many thousands of climate scientists are are working on it. Uh, and it basically mentioned uh, in the last report that was released last last year, it it, it mentioned that the lo- what they call the long term committed sea level rise. So the sea level rise that is already coming with the current uh, level of global warming um, is a few meters. Um, and at 1.5 degrees, which is almost inevitable by now, we're looking at six to seven meters of committed sea level rise. So that is a sea level rise that, that is definitely coming. We just don't know exactly when. We're talking about six to seven meters of global sea level rise uh, by 1.5 degrees. <laughs> so, yeah, we just got interrupted because my five-year-old daughter just came in, but it's actually perfect because... Let's say she's the reason why I want to speak with you. Yeah, great. Um, <laughs> because, and, and and let's do some climate 101, because I've been speaking with many people in the last, uh, let's say, year about climate. But most of the people, I would say, they're, they're well educated and, and everything like that. And I hear so much uh, misinformation. Uh, so I'm happy I can... Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to ask you a lot of questions. Just tell me when you get tired, because yesterday you were sprayed by the police and you were on the freeway and you were in jail because you as a scientist were blocking a a road because you don't want the sea level to rise seven meters in the Netherlands. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. One of the things I notice is that it's it's hard to. I mean, I I've learned to also accept like the emotions that that are part of it. Yeah. But at the same time, we also have to like keep a clear mind and and say, well, this is this is not because we are passionate, well-meaning people, but this is because uh, this is science. So okay, so my daughter is five year old, and you were saying, uh, okay, we don't know actually when it's going to happen, but what kind of time skills are we looking at? Well, the, the one I talked about five minutes ago is sea level rise, and that, and sea level rise is like the slowest component of of the climate system, uh, and that is for the simple reason that it takes a very long time to melt these ice sheets, um, and for the sea um, and for the ocean to adjust to the new temperature situation. So, so let's say roughly. Um, or part of the sea level rise will come from the ocean water that is expanding as it heats up. You know, everything that he, he, that heats up expands. Um, and part of it, and in the long term, most of it, uh, will come from melting uh, of ice that is currently on land, which uh, is mostly the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, but this long term, because in geology, long term can be billions of years. Yeah, yeah, no, we're we're talking about hundreds to thousands of years. That's that's the time it takes to melt at least the the, the two big ice sheets, the Greenland and the and the western and the western Antarctic ice sheet. Um, for glaciers, we're talking often about decades to maybe hundreds of years. And just to give an order of magnitude idea, um, if all the glaciers in the world melted. Uh, it would cause roughly about 30, 40, 50 centimeters of sea level rise. Uh, so that's significant, not for most countries, not disastrous, but it's 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 quite significant. 
Um, if we talk about the Greenland ice sheet, it would raise sea level by about seven meters. Um, if we talk about the Antarctic ice sheet, we'd talk about 50 to 60 meters of sea level rise if the thing melted entirely. Um, and now the Antarctic ice sheet can basically be divided up in the East Antarctic ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet. Because, uh, I mean, they are both connected, but they react differently to the, to the, to the current warming. Uh, and the um, uh, West Antarctic ice sheet is by far the most, uh, un, uh, the most unstable one. Um, and if that one goes, we're talking about three to four meters of sea level rise. Um, so at this point in time, at least, most glaciologists, the, those are the people that study the ice sheets, um, are looking at the West Antarctic ice sheet because it's it's collapsing or it's it's getting close to a tipping point uh, faster than we thought um, during my studies, at least, which is for roughly a decade ago. Yeah, so we always thought that the Greenland ice sheet was the more unstable one, but it turns out it's most like it's it's almost certainly the West Antarctic ice sheet. So yeah, but you you asked about the effects of climate change. Uh, sea level rise is obviously only one of them. It's it's the one we can imagine best, and the one and the uh, and the one that is also the slowest component. But in the short term, I'm most worried about the extreme heat and the extreme drought, especially in northern hemisphere summertime, because most people in the world live in the northern hemisphere. Yeah, I think we've experienced in the Netherlands the, since about 2018. Four, four out of our five summers were extremely dry. Uh, we had about two heat waves per summer, where the historical average is one heat wave in about every five years, I think. And this is quite worrying. And we don't fully understand why, especially in Europe, these extremes are increasing so fast. Um, so Could it just, be a coincidence? No, we don't think so. First, let's so uh, the Earth has warmed up by just over one degree by now. It's about one. Because point when one. you talk about warming, you uh, measure warming against what is it, eighteen hundred or? Yeah, so I always the, think the, the time that Vincent van Gogh was alive, right? <laughs> like the, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, exactly, and and that's defined at least in climate science as uh, the period from eighteen fifty to nineteen hundred. The, the average global temperature in, in that period. So by now, the Earth has heated up by about 1.2 degrees. Um, but we see that in Europe, uh, it's about twice as much. So we're talking about more than two, than two degrees. Uh, and if you look at the extremes, so ex especially the extremes in um, high temperatures, so heat waves and stuff, uh, it's four times as much. Um, so that's why these heat waves, or at least that, that, that explains partly why these heat, heat waves are increasing so fast in the last decade or so. Um, and if we do, uh, we do understand why Europe is heating up on average about twice as fast, but we do not really understand why the extremes are heating up four times as fast. Um, and it's the extremes that have most impact. You know, it's, it's not one degree more or two degree more, two degrees more on a regular day, uh, it's the heat waves um, and, the, and the droughts that actually have a much larger societal impact. Um, so only looking at the averages is, is kind of, um, I wanted to say misleading, but it's, it's missing the point, I think. Um, and so that's the thing that worries me most, that we don't even understand why these um, extreme temperatures are increasing so fast. It's probably related to the jet stream, uh, which is the flow of air at about 10 kilometers height. Um, but yeah, it's it's quite a long and complex story and we don't fully understand it. And what about um, uh, the, so the end of last year, beginning this year, there were some extreme cold waves in um, uh, yeah. the northern, northern part of America. Is that related yeah. to climate change? And in yeah. general, how much, how, how certain can you say that? Because if there's a heat wave, okay, you, you look statistically, but if, if there's a yeah. heat wave, well, tomorrow would be too early, but in this <laughs> summer, how, how certain could you say, well, this, so how this is related to climate change or it's not related to. Yeah. So the, you can never say that one, certain heat wave is caused by climate change um but what 
what climate scientists are saying now uh, is that each and every heat wave has become more likely and is more intense um, than it would have been without climate change. Um, and especially heat wave is the effect we can most easily link to climate change. Uh, and there's actually since a couple of years, there's a new research field in climate science, which is, which is called attribution studies. Uh, and there they actually calculate um, um, the likelihood of a certain weather event that could be drought, it could be flooding, it could be heat waves, it could be uh, cold snaps. Etc. Uh, to what extent climate change can explain that weather phenomenon? Um, I think if you Google attribution stu studies or something like that, you'll find it. It's a website from the UN. Um, and in the case of heat waves, almost all of them are uh, caused or related uh, to climate change. Just, uh, uh, just to give you an idea, in the Netherlands, uh, I just looked this up about a year ago. Uh, we had... Um, uh, we had about 17 heat waves between 1900 and uh, the year 2000. Um, and we also had uh, 17 what we call Elfstedentochten, which is uh, an, ice an ice skating event in the Netherlands um, between uh, 11 cities. Um, and we can only do it when it's cold enough. So between 1900 and 2000, we had both 17 heat waves and 17 uh, elf stated tochten. They were, per they, were, they were perfectly balanced. Uh, since the year 2000, we had zero elf stated tochten. And I think that we are at 14 heat waves by now. Uh, but that but that's, of course, only in 23 years. You know, it's not uh, in 100 years. So you, you can see this, this, this massive shift in what, in what, well, is now a new normal uh, in at least my country. So we're already, so when we're talking about the climate crisis, we're already there. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. So we cannot, uh, we cannot prevent uh, the climate crisis. No, exactly. And and that's one of my frustrations that the, the by now famous 1.5 degrees is somehow framed as, as safe. But if you would ask a climate science scientist, I, I think none of them would agree that 1.5 degrees of global warming is 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 somehow safe. Okay, let, so let's let's get specific because I think this uh, could help. Uh, I wrote a short article about this as well. That because all these numbers and everything, it can get very complex. I think we get into action more when we can imagine. Okay, what would this look like, or what would that look like? So, what would the one 0.5 degree society look like uh, compared to what we are experiencing already now. Yeah, so we're, we're now we're 1.2 or something like that. 1.5 is obviously just just three three tenths of a, of a degree more. Um, but um, in the middle of last year, um, a, a, a review paper in Science was published uh, by a couple of dozen climate scientists. Uh, which was about tipping points in the climate system. Um, and I don't think I have to talk about tipping points that much, but it's basically when the system flips over into a new stable state. And the paper estimated, or at least it first identified, I think it was 18 tipping points in the climate system. Um, and it tried to estimate the, the global temperature increase for each tipping point to tip to switch, to, to fall over. Um, and it concluded there, as I said, I think that there were 18 tipping points uh, in, in the climate system. I mean, we've known about this for decades, by the way. Um, but now it tried to put a number on these tipping points, on each and every one of them. And for four of the, the 18 tipping points, um, the temperature increase was the best estimate, at least was put at 1.5 degrees of global warming. Uh, and of those tipping points there was the greenland ice sheet there was the west antarctic ice sheet and there was the tropical coral reefs uh, which basically means that if we pass 1.5 degrees uh, these things will go uh, these these systems will flip over from the state that they're in right now to a new state which and that would that would lead to those several meters yeah uh, exactly. sea, sea level rise that yeah. you spoke about earlier yeah 
Exactly. And unfortunately, there's quite a big uncertainty here. So there was an uncertainty range attached to it, but the but the best estimate was 1.5 degrees. Um, for the Greenland ice sheet, we are already in the uncertainty range. So it could already be at this point in time that we pass the tipping point for the Greenland ice sheet. Um, I don't know this uncertainty rates range by heart, but it's probably 10 to 20 percent that we already passed the tipping point or something like that. Um, but what could this mean for just like uh, life in the Netherlands? What what would change? Well, in the long term, that we we cannot continue to live where where we do right now, or at least the people in the West, which includes your family as well. Uh, I'm sorry to say so. Um, it's it's in the long term. It it will take decades because we're luckily for us at least we're a rich country and we have we're very experienced in building. Uh, dikes and and all that kind of stuff um i do not know that much about it but i've been to a few talks of water engineers in the netherlands and they say that up until one meter of sea level rise we we can handle it's expensive but we can handle it between one and two meters it's it's quite hard and quite expensive but we might be able to handle it and above two or three meters there's just simply no way we can still do this but that that was if you talk yes, about, if you say decades, then you're talking about 40, 50, 60 years or something like that. Yeah, probably. But the biggest uncertainty in climate science is in sea level rise. It's, yeah. it's, so that has the biggest uncertainty range. Um, so it's yeah, I'm, I'm always tying it back to, so if, if uh, my daughter or people listening to this, they have children. Uh, so if, if you're, if my daughter is five, then when, let's say when she's 50 or something, this could happen, but for, for sure, when she has children herself and, and these children are, um, how you say it, uh, adults, uh, yeah. that's, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about uh, hundreds of years in the future. We're no, talking about something that some of us and for sure our mm -hmm. children and for sure, our grandchildren will have to deal with. Yeah, definitely. Which definitely. is the part I don't understand about, because I I understand that, um, you know, many of the, the, the people who are in power now who are kind of blocking the scientific climate policy. So the, the ones that are ignoring what climate scientists like you are saying that we need to do right now, so they're science deniers because they're ignoring the science. Most of those yeah. people are, let's say, they're over 50 at least. Yeah, I think so. But they have, many of them have children. Many of them have yeah. grandchildren. So what what's going wrong there? Because is there is it that, that somebody didn't explain it to them? Or is it that, I mean, I know you're not, I mean, you're a scientist, <laughs> but uh, I don't know who, who else can I ask, you know? Uh, them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that that's hard. I, I, maybe they don't know. Maybe they hope for some magical uh, technological innovation, which is what many people do, especially politicians. But the honest answer is, I don't know. Maybe they don't think about it. That might be, that might be the best explanation. So what I hear from many people as well is, uh, it's too late. So they they kind of start to understand the science a little bit or they, they know that already say, yeah, okay, well, we're doomed. Uh, we cannot do anything anyway. Yeah, that that's something I don't agree with. Uh, I mean, there's no way we're going to avoid serious consequences from this climate crisis. Uh, we've left it too late. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're doomed. Uh, and that's also what the science is telling us. Because uh, the warming... Uh, the average global warming is directly linearly related to the cumulative CO2 emissions. So basically each and every ton, each and every kilo of CO2 causes the same amount of warming. Um, and the climate scientists are also quite clear that below two degrees, um, this, this relationship between cumulative CO2 emissions and temperature will remain more or less lin uh, linear. So there, so there, in that sense, there's no tipping point. The climate system has no um, runaway effect. You know, it's not like if you, uh, if you pass 1.5 degrees, we end up at 
at five five degrees of global warming um, at a certain point. So, um, but it is true that that you know the, f the further we go along this path, um, the more you know the more severe these consequences will be. So, um, how what is the is there is there a big difference between because we were speaking about? So we're now at one point two average uh we're already witnessing effects uh, you you spoke about 1.5 which was once considered safe but this was also kind of an estimate because i think you have to pick some number right at that point yeah. the paris agreement they had to they didn't have all the knowledge that we have now but then um okay so is is there a big difference between one and a half and two degrees so if we're living in a two two degrees society how would it be different from the one and a half degree society. Yeah, it will be more extreme in each and every way. Um, it's it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know by heart how many more heat waves we'll have and how many more droughts we'll have. And I'm, I'm, I know that there are these beautiful tables in the IPC report that that um, calculate this. But I, I, to be honest, I don't know these numbers by heart. Um, but the thing is, ab above two degrees, we are talking about many parts of the world actually becoming un uh, uninhabitable. Uh, then we're talking about large areas around the equator, obviously, because that's where it's warmest. Um, and th th those includes a bunch of very densely populated countries, most notably India, obviously. Um I mean, now in summer, we they 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 almost reach fifty degrees there at at some points, and the extremes are increasing about twice as fast. So we're we're talking about fifty to fifty four de degrees in summer. Uh, so you know, at a certain point, people just can't live there anymore, which means they have to move to another place. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so that's so we're talking about millions and millions, or possibly more, uh, yeah, tens of millions or yeah. whatever people that yeah. have to move to another place in the world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, e I mean, e easily tens of millions. It's it's most uh, it, it, it's most likely in the hundreds of millions so 10 percent of the people in the world live just 10 meters above sea level or less so between zero and and 10 meters above sea level and if we reach these these tipping points then uh the greenland ice sheet will add seven meters and the western arctic ice sheet will will, will, will cost uh, three meters of sea level rise so then we're already talking about 10 meters of sea level rise and what about two and a half degrees Oh, it's arguably more. I, as I said, I, I don't know all these numbers by heart, but a two and a half degree world is a world. I don't think I want to think about that. It's it's it will it it will be a planet that we do not recognize anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, it just it just scares me. And so you've you've been studying the science, but are you? One one of the things I hear is about okay, climate science. They know they know about the problem. They know about the causes and and everything like that. Um, but the solutions are just like uh, did, we don't really know what to do. Um, and you know, do I mean the the so first question is: Do you have a sense of what the Netherlands is doing and what around the world what countries are already doing to kind of try to prevent this? Uh, yeah, sure. I think before I answer this question, it's good to give two very simple numbers. Um, the first one is the, what we call the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees, which basically um, is, the, is the amount of CO2 that the world can still emit before we hit 1.5 degrees. And climate scientists can, can give this 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 number or this budget uh, yeah because the the crt we emit basically it will stay in the atmosphere forever until you know we take yeah. it out or something like that right exactly. so you're not talking about the co2 that that goes back into the ocean or, or something like that but no the, no the co2 no. that's already uh, above the like the the level that the earth systems absorb yeah yeah exactly so um, this carbon budget is at this point in time, we're talking uh, the middle of March uh, 2023, uh, is roughly 370 gigatons. Uh, and a gigaton is a billion tons uh, of CO2. Um, so that's the amount of CO2 the world can emit before we hit 1.5 degrees. Um, 
and at this moment in time, the world emits about 42, 41 to 42 gigatons of CO2 per year. Um, so, well, it's quite easy to calculate that we have about eight and a half to nine years left uh, at current emission levels before we hit 1.5 degrees. So that's the beginning of 2030s. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. So when my daughter is like uh, 15, 16, 17 years old, that's yeah, that's the exactly, issue. exactly. And that is obviously if the if the emissions stay at current levels. Um, but the idea is that we, of course, decrease our um, our emissions. And if you just do some very simple math and you calculate how much the CO2 emissions have to go down each year. Uh, to stay within this this uh, 370 gigatons, uh, you find that they have to decrease by 10% a year starting today. So we have to reduce our CO2 emissions by 10% each and every year uh, to have a f um, to stay within the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. And how how much have they been decreasing uh, the last years? Uh, I think last last year they went up by I think about 0.8%. They went um, up. They went up, yeah. And okay, they went so up. So we have to before. decrease by we have to decrease them by 10% each year. By 10% but, each year. But so yeah. far they have been going up. Exactly, exactly. So far the only thing in the last 50 years or whatever uh, that brought down CO2 emissions at least on a global level were economic crises. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, or the or the Corona pan the Corona pandemic. Those are the only events that 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 caused a temporary dip in the uh, continuous growth of the emissions. Do you know how much the dip was from the Corona crisis? Yeah, uh, on the global level, it was about five and a half percent. So that's about half of what we need to exactly, do. exactly, yeah. and we need that uh, you know year after year. That's that gives that. I mean, if that's not a crisis situation, I don't know what is. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, and just to give you an idea, the the Netherlands is doing uh, about two percent a year uh, on average. I mean, it fluctuates a bit, but we we're decreasing our emissions by roughly two percent a year, and I think most Western countries are in that ballpark. Yeah. Um, so, so we're what, not even what, close. Okay, so if we keep doing this, like going at this rate and maybe like increasing it a little bit, let's say the, the green left parties win in the Netherlands and, and all over the world, we start to increase it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, everyone gets solar panels and yeah. all that stuff. So not, not too radical, you know, but just like, oh, we, we are going to change it a little bit. What do you think? Because we talked about one and a half, two degrees, two and a half degrees, which of these will we... Uh, Rich. Well, if 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 current worldwide policies are actually implemented, we're talking about uh, just above two degrees of global warming. Yeah. Um, the, and, the, and if, the policies, which with by which you mean, like the promises that the governments have made already about what they need to do. Yeah. So there there are the there are the current pledges and the current policies. So the so the current policies are I think in line with two point two degrees two point one degrees, uh, which means that if for the rest of the centuries the current policies stay in place but nothing changes, world world worldwide we end up at just above two degrees, um, and if all the pledges and with pledges I mean climate ne climate neutrality in in twenty fifty that's the um, thing that is pledged most often. Uh, we're talking about just below two degrees, 1.7, 1.8. Okay. Um, and just below two degrees is not, is not the society, uh, we want our children to grow up in, right? No, def no, no. definitely not. Cause we, we most likely passed a number of tipping points and we will see a, a, a severe increase in weather related, um, uh, disasters basically. Um, so yeah, and as I said, what is needed by now for uh, 1.5 degrees is 10% CO2 reduction per year. Um, now the thing that I learned only in the last half a year to a year is that um, the IPCC, well, it has three working groups, the IPCC. So uh, they're basically three reports that, that are released. Uh, the first one is called working group one, and then the second one's working group two and working group three. The first one explains uh, why the climate is changing, 
Uh, the second one is explaining what are the consequences. Uh, and the third one is explaining what what can we do about it. Uh, and my studies for my master and PhD only looked at uh, working group number one and two. So more like the physical science. Uh, and we never looked at working group three. Uh, because that's more economic policy driven, you know, it's, you know, how many solar panels, what kind of policies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but for my job, for the job that I have now, at least, um, uh, I learned quite a bit about working group three uh, and the policies and the models that they propose and implement. Um, and instead of proposing a 10% CO2 reduction per year, which is what should be which is what they should have been doing. They propose uh, for 1.5 degree pathway, as they call it, about five to six to seven percent CO2 reduction per year. Uh, and then they claim that this is in line with 1.5 degrees. Um, but that's quite weird because then, you know, you go over the budget, obviously. Um, but what they assume is that in the that after about 2050, um, people will take carbon out of the atmosphere at an industrial scale. Really? So how, yeah. how will they do that? Because I spoke to a geologist, to Marcia Bjornhout, and she said, well, that's quite, uh, <laughs> you can plant a lot of trees, you can do a lot of stuff, right? But Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And this is, this. I, uh, there are few topics within the climate discussion that get that get me so upset as, as this one, which is called an overshoot, because you go over the budget. Uh, or it's called negative emissions. So at this moment, we're doing positive emissions. We emit to, to the atmosphere. And negative emissions is taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. The thing is that we've already planned that the next generation will do this. Because that's basically what it comes down to, right? I mean, Yeah, my daughter will be like 30 in her 30s exactly, by then. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so her job can be to figure out how to take all the uh, uh, you know uh, refugees from india and everywhere are coming here uh, during the heat waves yeah exactly exactly okay. so yeah so it's not just that we say hey guys sorry for all the climate change that w that we've caused but uh, you also have to take hundreds of billions of tons of co2 out of the atmosphere because we because we decided to go to go over the budget and we assumed that you would take it out again um, and the, at, at this moment in time, the technologies to do that at the scale that is required, which is, as I said, uh, hundreds of billions of tons in, in total, um, they're just not there. We still have to invent these technologies. Uh, I mean, if, if this doesn't border insanity, then, then I don't know what is, um, it's, it's an ethical on the, on a scale that, that I'm, 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 I'm struggling to find words, to be honest um it's yeah um yeah as you notice i'm struggling to find words um uh so but yeah we we already assumed that that the next generation would do this just so that we can claim that six percent co2 reduction a year is enough but we're not even close to doing that because because global co2 emissions are roughly flat they 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 increase a little bit or they decrease a, a little bit but they're not even close to doing minus minus six percent a year so that's why you were on the freeway yesterday exactly exactly and as long and and, and at the same time our our government is claiming to be aligned with 1.5 degrees which is just mm -hmm. it's just it's just nuts it's just so nuts. just to go back to what we talked mm -hmm. about earlier uh what you were um uh, demanding on the freeway is actually uh, a, because the Dutch government promised that they would, uh, by the end of 2022, they would stop investing in new um, fossil fuel sources, right? Something. No, like that. that's uh, oh yeah, that's yeah, that's actually a different topic. This was about fossil fuel subsidies. All right. Yeah. Um, we call them subsidies, and that's actually quite right because the because the World Bank also call them subsidies, but. Uh, in practice, it's more like tax breaks um, for the fossil fuel industry. And what is the, the um, so the fossil fuel industry is is taking more fossil fuels out of the uh, earth? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they don't have to pay certain taxes, which you and I have to pay. Uh, just as an example, um, if you buy a train ticket, there's a certain tax on that. It's value added tax and all that kind of stuff. 
while if you buy um if you buy a plane ticket uh there's no tax uh on the fuel that goes into the plane that's a direct subsidy which favors air air travel over train over train travel and that's just one except uh one um example i mean um but actually uh you you mentioned an interesting topic because um that's or at least i think it's interesting because it because it goes back to the carbon budget that I talked about five minutes ago. You know, it's the 370 gigatons that the world can still emit. Uh, but if you look at the current fossil fuel infrastructure that, that we have worldwide, so that's not the infrastructure we are still de we are developing or we are going to develop in the future. We, if you just look at the current fossil fuel infrastructure, uh, the best estimate is that uh, this will emit about twice as much CO2 as the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. So we are already overly invested, if that's the right word. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but um, into fossil fuels and, and, and the infrastructure, uh, which means that we either go above 1.5 degrees um, if, we, if, if we finish this infrastructure until the end of its planned lifetime, uh, or we have to, uh, or we get uh, uh, stranded assets on a ba basically on a massive scale, um, and therefore the scientific consensus is that all new fossil fuel projects are in violation with the 1.5 degrees uh, temperature target. It's that simple. It's 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 no more complicated than what I just explained. The current fossil fuel infrastructure is already twice as much as the carbon that can still emit. Uh, and what are governments and fossil fuel companies around the world doing? They're still investing in new fossil fuel projects. Yeah, like um, Shell is is planning to drill for new resources in, in the Netherlands, in the Wattensee, I think. Yeah, exactly. They have about 768, if I remember correctly. It's in the 700, at, at least. Um Pro, uh, projects that they want to develop within the next few years or decades. Just like all the other oil and gas and coal companies, by the way. Um, so they are so they're basically taking a massive gamble that we you know uh, just that we will finish these projects uh, and go far above the 1.5 degrees. So before we speak about Shell, yesterday I've been kind of following the, the demonstration online and I've been publishing some columns and I've been kind of monitoring the reactions also because my previous episode, as you know, was with Lee McIntyre about uh, science denial yeah. Yeah. And, and looking at the patterns. So um, maybe we can just do some quick questions because I get all, I notice I'm getting the same responses because I'm, I'm obviously supporting uh, Extinction Rebellion. I'm not uh, a climate activist myself. But I think uh, you guys are heroes and, and I have a lot of respect for that. And uh, who knows, I might join you as well. But that also, yeah, everyone has to do what their, look what their part is, right? But yeah, so definitely. what what I get as a reaction. So we've already covered, is it too late, basically? And you're saying, well, no, well, it's too late to remain under a safe level, but it's not... I mean, you want a two degree society instead of a two and a half degree society if you can choose, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And that's actually also what the IPCC says. It says every fraction of degree matters, especially above 1.5 degrees. Then the next thing is okay. Um, but what, what Extinction Rebellion is proposing is unreasonable and it will basically mean that our society will collapse because the economy will collapse uh, so the the measures that you are proposing that we should take will actually lead to a collapse of society now because uh, because of well, all those reasons yeah I, I my short response would be that the future is going to be radical anyway uh, we've left it simply too late. We either have radical climate policy or we get radical climate change. Those are basically the only two options that are left after more than three decades of delay or denial and, and all that kind of stuff. As I said, 10% CO2 reduction per year is radical. Don't get me wrong. 
But if we don't do it, we'll get radical climate change. Uh, I mean, those are the only two options that that are left. Uh, and and I just prefer to get radical climate policy than to get radical climate change. But then they're saying, well, then you should be blocking a freeway in China because what we do in Holland uh, doesn't have any effect anyway. We're such a small country and China is bo- is and India and all those countries are uh, building coal plants. So you should be going there and until China starts to do something, why should we be, you know, uh, the best boy in the class? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I get that response a lot as well. Uh, first of all, I think the per capita CO2 emissions of the Netherlands are still higher than the per capita CO2 emissions of China. Um, so, of course, we are a smaller country, uh, or at least we emit less, but that's because we are uh, a smaller country. Um, second of all, most or most about 30 percent of China's CO2 emissions is for the products that they make for us. So that's the iPhone. That's all the plastic uh, stuff, etc., that you have in your house. They emit the CO2, we get the stuff, or at least that's how the, the CO2 accounting works. Um, and, third, and third of all, I think we also have a much higher historical responsibility for the climate crisis than they have. They, they only started to increase their emissions in the last roughly 10 to 15 years, uh, while we had uh, high emissions for many decades in a row. Um, and it doesn't mean that actually China is not is not uh, investing in renewable energy. Roughly half the uh, roughly half the uh, global added capacity in renewable energy is in China. So they're investing a lot in pollution, but they're also investing a lot yeah. in green energy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So they simply need both because their economy is growing so fast. Uh, but they are actually investing more in renewable energy than we do. Plus they actually control all the supply chains of renewable energy. So they control the critical metals that go into windmills and solar panels and batteries and and stuff like that, which in the long term or or maybe even the short term could, could become quite problematic for, for the European continent as well. So another one, which is a little bit more complex and I get it. And I'm, I think we need different voices in climate, uh, let's say, supporters. A lot of people I speak to, they're actually working on on uh, doing something good. Let's say, okay, there are the people who speak about, in that you say, Duurzaamheid, sustainability. And we need to do something for sure. We have a big problem, but we need to keep everyone on board. And for instance, I, I'm not very good at diplomacy and I look at the science and then I think, well, the science speaks about climate crisis and it's actually geologically speaking a climate crisis and ecological crisis because the earth had many climate crises and geological crises, but we weren't around. Now we are around yeah. anyway. Um, so... Um, and then even even though I'm not an activist, but I support activists, that also scares off a lot of people. And what what the one I get is, yeah, but you're losing. And I, I don't know if this is a typical Dutch word, but draagvlak. <laughs> so it means that, for instance, we had it during Corona, is that, okay, if you want the society to do what is necessary, you need to keep them on board. So maybe let's say the government would propose uh, to take radical measures that would lead to polarization. Uh, A lot of people that are already skeptical would not be on board. Uh, And then in the end, nothing would happen. So it's better to take a slower approach with more diplomatic and using euphemisms like sustainability. Because then, although it will be slower and we don't get what we want, at least we will achieve a little bit of it. Yeah. Um, well, my reaction would be that that is not how societies have changed in the past, or at least not how societies have changed radically in the past. Because what we're trying to do, and, and well, first of all, let me say that now I'm I'm not talking about climate science anymore, but more social science, which is not the thing that I'm, uh, well, uh, that that I'm interested in most. But it's it's basically about what they call shifting the Overton window. Uh, and the Overton window is is the part in the political discussion that is considered acceptable. 
and we as least as um exchange rebellion are trying to push that towards well either the left or the green direction whatever way you want to call it by doing radical stuff because shifting the often window towards the left or the green part causes the center to shift as well maybe i should just give an explanation about a, a, few, a few months ago we had uh, just stop oil in the uk who threw soup at paintings i mean these paintings were obviously protected by uh, by glass plates which um, by the way there was one of those beautiful ironies because i was talking about i associate van gogh with the industrial revolution so those yeah. were van gogh paintings so they were throwing yeah. soup at the paintings of someone who painted them during the time that the problem really started <laughs> yeah 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 exactly just to be specific at the glass covering the painting and exactly. they were not intending to damage the painting itself Exactly, exactly. But what these actions do is they shift the Overton window. And because uh, by that time, that was considered too radical. But I often got the criticism, you know, yeah, I understand that these uh, kids or, or these or these young adults are freaking out about, about the climate crisis, but I don't agree with what they're doing. But why don't you go protest in front of Shell's headquarters? Um, while just a month before that, protesting before Shell headquarters was considered extremist, and they and they basically said, "Why don't you walk in a climate march?" Um, you know, and five years before that, or I think I walked my first climate march about eight years ago, or, or whatever. That was considered quite radical, actually. And there was yesterday actually also a protest in in front of a Shell building. Yeah, I think but so. Yeah. But that, yeah, you think so, because it was not on the news and yeah. it didn't get any coverage. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, I actually did uh, an action with uh, Scientist Rebellion on the exact same day that we had a, uh, someone who glued himself to a painting in the Netherlands, or again, the, the class before the, the painting. Um, we had zero media attention whatsoever. All the media attention was going to the guy who was doing that in the, in the museum. So... You, you're shifting the Overton window. And and yesterday we saw that as well. You know, by now it's easier for moderate people who never did any climate activism whatsoever to join a climate march because now the most radical thing is to be in a blockade where the police uses a water cannon. And these people might not want to join that part of activism, but they now they might think, okay, well, the least I can do is walk a climate march. Right. And so, for instance, because you were blocking the freeway yesterday someone listening to this can propose to have all vegetarian lunches in their organization yeah. which just like a few years ago would was maybe considered too extreme or something but that might yeah. actually be like oh actually we can yeah we can do something and we don't like yeah. these extremists and blah 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 but yeah, uh, yeah okay S switching to an uh, we can speak about what people can actually do listening to this right but I, I think switching to a vegetarian or even vegan standard of food in organizations is for me is really a no-brainer if you do the calculations and everything but even that is is considered now too extreme and yeah so uh I, I, this is a part where i have to watch my words but in many organizations scientific organizations even this they're not doing to do their part for the climate crisis. yeah exactly exactly it's strange, by the way, why I have to watch my words, right? Because I thought we had yeah, exactly. like freedom of speech and academic yeah. freedom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I also really I... like my job, so uh, <laughs> I really need my job. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've been there as well. I, I actually, uh, in the last couple of months that I was doing my PhD, I gave actually a talk uh, at my department why I joined Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's called the Friday Earth Science Talk. So, so when was that? Uh, beginning of 2019. Uh, okay, so that's four, four years, year, ago. about four years that's, ago. Yeah. But that's, that's about four years ago. Um, and it's this informal talk uh, at Friday, four o'clock. And then after the talk, everyone has a beer and, you know, you you, you just, and then, and then the weekend starts. Um, and it was basically a talk about why I joined Extinction Rebellion, why I decided to join Extinction Rebellion. And actually many people refused to show up which was, you know, it was this informal talk where you have a couple of beers afterwards, but they just refused to show up. I mean, that was not all of them, but I think 
a quarter or a third or whatever was was just simply not showing up because they they thought that activism and academia should be strictly separated and it jeopardizes your objectivity etc et and i think that has changed a lot or dramatically in the last in the last four years one of the main things i do in this podcast is to explore interdisciplinarity where you know the traditional boundaries between sciences but also between science and society are kind of being beginning to blur and um so that this is one example of that i think where if you're a scientist you're not an activist or if yeah. you're like that right but so you're saying that so how how has your experience been and what have because let's speak from the perspective of scientist rebellion because all of them are working in scientific institutions so what have you heard about are they open about that in the institutions do they get support is it is it a problem or i'm i'm, I'm pretty sure that at least um, the majority is quite open about it I, th i think almost all of them i mean i i don't know all of them that well and we we don't meet on a weekly basis or whatever so i i don't know from all 81 that that joined yesterday but they share it on social media they they discuss it with their colleagues uh etc so i think it's it's they discuss this the vast majority of them maybe even all all of them actually mentioned this and discussed this with their colleagues yeah definitely and and do they get problems with this or is this uh no i don't think so no. okay. um but of course there's a selection bias here because the one that might get problems don't show up so i mean there could be a, a small bias there obviously yeah but that's a good point actually because i so i've heard personally from people i post sometimes on my linkedin about climate or about extinction rebellion and i've heard from some people saying well actually i agree with you but i'm not going to like your message because um if if i do that people in my organization can see that and that might cause problems for me. Yeah, yeah. And that's something I understand, to be honest. I mean, I don't like that our society is organized that way or that that that's social pressure is causing this kind of behavior or this kind of decisions. Um, but I do understand, you know, we all need a job, we all need to pay taxes and a mortgage. Uh, and most of people in academia actually like their job a lot because otherwise you would not be working in academia, I guess. Um, so it's something I, I completely understand. Um, and the advantage that I had in, in the beginning of 2019 when I did the, well, when I gave this talk is that I already decided to leave academia uh, or at least my, my PhD slash postdoc contract ended and I decided not to... to um, well not to stay in academia but why not because you were you're working in maybe the most relevant scientific field yeah. at the moment why did you decide to leave um well there are many reasons well there are there are a couple of reasons but one of them was that i became convinced that writing more papers uh, and doing more research was not going to be the the thing that would solve the climate crisis i mean don't get me wrong climate science is is Is, is we should definitely continue doing that don't get me wrong um but we know enough about this topic to 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 hit to hit the emergency break uh but we simply don't so i decided to become an activist uh one way or another um and first i did uh i was unemployed for about 11 months so close to a year uh and i i spent 80% of my time doing Extinction Rebellion related stuff. Uh, so I was also organizing these kinds of protests. I gave a lot of talks as well um, to convince people uh, to join Extinction Rebellion or to inform them about the climate crisis um, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then after a while, I, I well, I... Uh, I needed an income as well, and and I wanted to work again. But uh, it, I, it, I, I took all, I took almost a year off until the beginning of 2020 <laughs> things are moving fast huh? yeah <laughs> is, I'm, I'm, i'm calculating <laughs> uh, yeah um and then i worked for a small ngo called bank track for two years which is an ngo that is tracking the uh, what we call the un, what we called the unethical financing done by the banking system so basically the financing of deforestation 
uh, practices that cause human rights violations, and in my case, uh, financing fossil fuels. And which banks are we talking about? Are you are you able to say? Basically, all of them. Which are the worst? Uh, in the Netherlands, it's ING. Globally, it is JP Morgan Chase. We're talking about uh, uh, financing of about sixty billion US dollars per year that go into the fossil fuel industry for this one bank, JP Morgan Chase. So we're talking about a lot of money that is just, you know, continuing to to pump more uh, money into the fossil fuel industry, which is used for new fossil fuel projects, you know. And as I just explained, these fossil fuel power projects are uh, not in line with one point. Yeah, so we should be hitting the brakes, but we still have our foot on the gas pedal. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and now since, uh, since June last year, so... What is it about uh, nine nine months now? Um, I'm working for Milieu Defensie, which is part of the Friends of the Earth network in the Netherlands, and I'm working on the court case against uh, Shell, the big oil major. I'm one of the researchers there who is mostly looking at the climate reports uh, and what they mean to to this court case. So. With Lee McIntyre about science denial, we spoke about the Exxon New studies that, that came out uh, now, I think a couple of months ago, but this was already common knowledge that actually uh, the people that did your job, like this climate scientists in, in the, like 40 years ago, they were the best climate scientists were working for Exxon Mobile and those kind of companies. And they actually had very accurate prediction models of, of what we are in right now. The fossil fuel industry on a large scale, they, they knew actually the crisis that we are in right now and they knew what was coming. And instead of sharing this information with the public, they chose to keep it for themselves and actually chose to hire merchants of doubt. So sell doubt as, as their product. So yeah. they said, we're, yeah, we need the public to understand the uncertainties of the ca- yeah. climate crisis. This, this is all like, this is not, I mean, I'm sometimes disappointed that the conspiracy theorists, now we have an actual conspiracy theory and they choose to ignore it. But this is all <laughs> this is all 100% certain because we have the emails, we have everything, yeah, we, we know exactly. this. We don't exactly. know what they're doing now, but we know that uh, this is, yeah, historically the role that the fossil fuel industry, including Shell, uh, has played in, in the climate crisis. Yeah. And yeah, yesterday exactly. I was posting a lot about the Extinction Rebellion protest and I got some shell advertisement on my uh, <laughs> timeline, which is so funny because it was about that they're d- developing green diesel for a truck or something. And honestly, the feeling it gave me was like uh, Marlboro is advertising on my timeline for that they now have uh, cigarettes with vitamins. <laughs> uh, while one of my loved ones is is uh, suffering from lung cancer or something. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just saying a lot about Shell because I don't know how much you can say because you are working on the court case. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, uh, it, it Shell went into appeal. I think that's the way you say that in English. Yeah, can you can you bring us up to speed because many people maybe don't know about the court case against Shell and now it's about appeal, but there was a first court case already, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, which was at the end of 2020, and the verdict was almost two years ago now, uh, in 2021, uh, and the verdict was in line with what Milieu Defensi demanded from Shell, uh, which is that Shell, that the Shell Group, as it's called. Uh, reduces its emissions by 45% in 2030 compared to the year 2019. And in this case, it's important to emphasize that this is not just the emissions of Shell itself, so Shell's uh, offices and Shell's uh, refineries, but also of the products that that Shell is selling, which means your gasoline, or at least the gasoline they sell in um, in in their gas stations, which is called scope three. That's that's what um, that's the technical term at least. So that was the verdict, because that is in line with the global with uh, what is needed on a global average to stay to have any chance of staying below one point five degrees. This this the forty five percent reduction. I mean, is uh, is in line with that. So we demanded that Shell 
would do at least uh, the global average uh, of what is needed to to keep warming uh, to 1.5 degrees. And Shell's slogan is powering progress. Powering progress. And they're green, yeah. they're, they say they're a green company, so I assume they <laughs> happily complied with the judge's verdict. Uh, uh, no, they're not, or at least we don't see it any change in the policy what whatsoever while the policy was and i'm not i don't know the english term for this but uh, they had to comply with the verdict uh even though they appealed there's a technical uh english term for this that i don't know uh, yeah so until uh it doesn't mean that just because you appeal that you don't have to do anything now you have to act exactly as if, exactly as if, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, exactly. But uh, we saw no change in policy whatsoever um, from from Shell. Um, so they're simply not complying, at least as far as we can tell right now. Um, uh, and and then Shell decided to appeal, uh, and that's the part where I'm 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 working on together with the rest of, of my team, obviously, uh, and the lawyers. Um, and we expect that the case will go to court or at least the hearings will be at the end of this year so december 2023 maybe even a bit later so then shell is going to explain why they don't want to reduce their emissions exactly in accordance with yeah keeping it beyond below 1.5 degrees yeah exactly exactly and and roughly speaking the court case consists of two parts the first part is does shell actually have an obligation to reduce their emissions um, and preventing, uh, well, the, the climate crisis from escalating further. Um, and our lawyers are pretty sure that, that well, first of all, uh, in, the f- in the first verdict, the judge said, yes, Shell actually has um, an obligation to reduce its emissions. Uh, and our lawyers are convinced that, sh- that, this will, uh, that, this, that this part of the verdict will definitely remain there. Um, and then the second question you have to ask yourself is okay but by how much you know that's 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 the second part of the of the court case roughly speaking um and that's the 45 percent and there that's where milieu defense argued that shell should at least do the global average uh for what is needed to 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 um limit warming to 1.5 degrees and and the second part is the part that i'm doing or at least the the one the part that i'm i'm working on most uh, and there are a hundred reasons why shell should do more and there are a hundred reasons why shell should do less than 45 percent uh, reduction in 2030 um and that's and that's the part that i'm working on most mostly and how much reduction are they working on now do you know that from their Current policy plans, we estimate that Shell will not reduce their emissions whatsoever by, by 2030. So it will it will it will remain roughly flat. It might go up by a few percent. It might go down by a few percent, but uh, it will remain roughly flat. Right. So first, you studied climate science and and uh, the melting of the ice sheets. Then you left academia to join Extinction Rebellion, be, be a climate activist, and now you're working on a court case. Yeah. Quite interdisciplinary, but why? I mean, I can imagine you can go different directions, but why do you think this is the one of the most relevant things to work on? First of all, because of this, simply because of the size of Shell. Uh, Shell emits about 1.4 to 1.6 gigatons of co2 per year uh and to put that into perspective that's roughly nine times as much as my country the netherlands emits on a yearly basis so we're we're talking nine about times the, as much right? nine times as much because the netherlands does roughly uh, 150 megatons a year and shell does about 1.4 gigatons so so our prime minister i think is uh good friends with the ceo yeah. of shell or the ex-ceo that's or the ceo that's, that's the ceo said that he considered our prime minister a friend yeah and our prime minister one day later said in an in- interview that shell is a decent company uh right yeah so if if you could choose between rutte complying with the xr demands or him talking <laughs> to his friend and convincing him to to comply to milieu defensi 
that would be nine times more uh, effective or have yeah, nine times uh, more impact. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just saying something, yeah, but it's just, speaking, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, so, but, but it's just, I mean, the, the point remains that Shell is, in terms of emissions, there are only a few countries in the world that emit more than, than the company Shell. So Shell is saying they're powering progress, but they're actually powering the climate crisis. Yeah, we called it powering destruction. In powering our, destruction, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh in our uh in our written statement to the court um so it's first of all uh, um uh, uh the direct impact but we actually estimate that the indirect impact is much larger because if, if we can get shell um to lose the appeal which is what of course we're aiming for or at least we're we're aiming to to win this appeal, and we expect to to win it as well actually um, then it sends a message across all the boardrooms of all the oil and gas companies in the world. Um, because what I haven't discussed yet is that um, going above 1.5 degrees in legal terms means violating human rights on, an, on a global scale. Uh, so there is legal consensus around the world um, that going above 1.5 degrees means violating human rights and based on that principle we have sued shell so it's not based on the paris climate agreement or or whatever because shell uh is, is well it's it's uh there are no player um in uh in in the paris climate agreement but it's it's this universally accepted uh link between global warming um and human right violations which is set at 1.5 degrees so that's that's quite interesting, and I think we need also a little bit of hope now. But if I hear you correctly, what what you're saying is that we we have a big big problem now. We're in a crisis, but we we have pretty much all the science already that we need to do to do. We we also know basically what we need to do, but actually all the promises are already there, like all the uh, pledges and and. Uh, policies and everything but we even have all the laws already so uh if yeah, if all, exactly. all the judges in the world would start to sue everyone who is not uh, complying with uh or actually you yeah i don't know anything i spoke to your ex our colleague hannah prince in this podcast yeah. a few episodes yeah. ago so i i told her already i don't know you know this is one area i don't know anything about but i know about precedent which means that if if uh, milieu defense is successful this could really you're already kind of giving the recipe to other countries yeah. and other other people who want to do this with other companies as well yeah exactly one of my that's actually the job of one of my colleagues to to export our knowledge and 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 the tactics and and all this kind of stuff uh to other ngos you know uh in other countries because Winning against Shell was a landmark, of course, and it will help the climate. But it, what will really help the climate is, you know, if all fossil fuel companies are actually reducing their emissions. Um, so in that sense, we we we're trying to export this, this um, yeah, this knowledge and this idea and this concept. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and the last couple of years, I don't know the numbers by heart, but we saw an absolute explosion in court in climate related court court cases uh, and that's not just against fossil fuel companies most of them are against governments uh, for not doing enough uh, but we also see an increase in um, uh, in fossil fuel companies getting sued right i'm going to get more into this in uh, in some time i'm going to interview uh, jessica then outer you probably know her she's uh, well anyway she, they're working on like uh, eco side and uh, yeah, rights of nature, yeah. but I was just about to say, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, okay, I want to uh, talk about the demonstration yesterday as well, but I think maybe first, can you just tell us because people, I think most people are already kind of understanding that we're in a big problem and we really need to do something, but they feel powerless and they feel depressed because they don't know what to do and of course uh, and in previous episodes I already covered what you can do is is get into action because it's actually very therapeutic and it's very important because you show your yeah. support and you explain this as well so yeah. anyone who wants to consider being a climate activist you know go to extinction rebellions website or something like that yeah 
Yeah. Then, then litigation, of course, is is one uh, yeah. thing that can be very effective. What what are other ways that people can really do some? And of course, getting the solar panels on your house and all that. Yeah, but exactly. I mean, I would love to do that, but I don't have the money for that. I would love to have an electric car uh, or yeah. no car at all. But it's for me, it's yeah, uh, yeah, hard to do that. But what else can we do? Uh, well, it's it's as we said, it's it's reducing your own what is often called carbon footprint um, by you know. Uh, well, cutting your meat and, and dairy consumption, uh, ditching your car or at least using it less. Uh, flying is a big one, obviously. Um, and all the stuff that we buy in, in, in general, those are the biggest um, emissions for the average person in a country like, like the Netherlands. And, and I urge everyone to do that. Don't get me wrong. But for me, it's more important to become an activist because that's the only thing that can actually change the system. Yeah. Uh, we had this I, slogan in, in the Netherlands and Goed Milieu begins by yourself, like a good em- environment starts with you. Yeah. So that's still, I think a lot of people are still there. It's also, look, so for instance, a lot of comments about the demonstration. I heard like uh, there were some photos of the XR demonstration and people were saying, well, but they have plastic uh, bags. Yeah with them or something exactly. like that. you know when you were getting sprayed with with uh, the water cannons people were actually saying oh but they're wearing plastic raincoats now huh look at yeah, that exactly, but, exactly. yeah exactly exactly yeah yeah um and and what i often say is that the, the whole concept of the carbon footprint was invented by bp by british petroleum uh with the idea to put the blame on you and me to for you and me to to consider oh i should reduce this or that while while the system itself stays they stays in place um so it's definitely good to reduce your own carbon footprint uh i'm a vegetarian i don't fly anymore uh, etc etc um but person but that's a personal belief i believe more in becoming an becoming an activist or at least something that that changes the system, but that changes the power structure, and that, yeah, as you said, you can also do with with uh, litigation. Um, you can obviously vote uh, for uh, a green uh, party. Um, well, you vote once every four or five years, or what, or whatever. So please do that, but don't don't do more, or or, or you become active in a in a green party, um, and um, yeah. So and and the last one could also be and and that's what more and more people are starting to do change your career you know refuse to work for a company that 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 is doing harm even if your job is not causing any harm and you know switch to something that that you know is actually creating real real value in the world uh, I mean I think working career is 80,000 hours if I remember correctly something like like that I mean, uh, it's it's way more than you can than you can ever do with with activism, or whatever. So, in a certain sense, that could be the most important decision that you can make to to switch careers. But it's up to everyone themselves, uh, of course. But it's still a little bit strange that um, uh, just speaking in the Netherlands, but everyone has to look in their own country. Um, there there are still universities in the netherlands i see the shell logo everywhere so museums the cultural industry and and many scientific institutions still have fossil fuel uh sponsors and uh, everything like that right so if there's one uh like uh how do you say that party in society that should be on on your side it's the academic institutions and the health institutions because yeah the climate crisis is is actually also the greatest health crisis that humanity yeah. has ever seen and we know what happened with corona but what happened with corona is nothing compared to the health crisis that uh, yeah. we're heading towards with our eyes open and we know 100 percent certain that we're going to have major major health crisis in the netherlands if we if we don't radically change uh, something yeah. now yeah, exactly. That's that's why actually there is a subgroup of Extinction Rebellion that is called um, XR Healthcare, I think, or XR Geneeskunde, or, or yeah, the health professionals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a word. Yeah. So they're 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 looking at it from their perspective and saying, you know, uh, you know, if I'm a healthcare professional, I also should be doing this kind of stuff. 
because the healthcare industry, if it was a country, I would be the, I think the fifth most polluting country in the world. Yeah, that, oh, that could well be the case. I, I know that in the Netherlands, the healthcare, uh, healthcare is responsible for 7% of the emissions. So yeah, yeah if you which is that, not that insignificant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. And they have to prepare because they're the ones uh, when, when the heat waves come and everything like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. But how, yeah, hmm. how, how do I say this? My question is like, um, so I'm saying that if, if there's one party that should be on your side, that's the academic institutions and the healthcare institutions. And yeah. do, you, do you think they are doing enough? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I don't talk to them that much. Uh, th most likely they're not doing enough, but basically no one in society is doing enough, or at least. So um, the default is that they're not doing enough. Um, but, but that's it. Huh? We're all waiting for each other. And um, yeah. I spoke to uh, actually, okay, uh, this is a segue to the protests as well from yesterday, because uh, a couple of episodes ago, I spoke to your other colleague, Chris Julien. Yeah. You know him yeah. as well, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, actually, he got hit in the face yesterday by the police while he was lying on the ground. Okay, Did you hear I didn't that? know that. Yeah, no, he, he's, I mean, he's actually a friend of mine. So, uh, yeah, he posted that on uh, on social media that the police hit him in the face yesterday while he was uh, not doing anything peacefully protesting. I didn't see him. Unfortunately, I'm not surprised, or at least it's, it, it, it's, it's telling that I'm not surprised. Um, I was arrested before him, so and and I have been in contact since. All right. Uh, so just so what I wanted to say is that he said something in in my interview with him. He said something which was very insightful for me. He he spoke about this Greek concept of paresia, which basically means telling the truth. But on the one hand, we live in a society where you have the scientific reality. So what is science saying about us? But then we also, we have a society, so we, we have opinions and perspectives on the scientific reality and uh, also, also social conventions and social norms. But at this moment, the social norms and conventions are not aligned with the scientific reality. So yeah. if I say we're in a cli climate crisis and we, uh, and we should really not only be talking about this, but about talking about this most of the time, I would say, yeah in in our organization then this is met either by like uh, silence or resistance or outright hostility which is like it reminded me you had this dutch doctor lense meinsma and in the 60s he did his phd on the harmful effects of smoking and yeah. there's this this um clip of him where he he had a friend selling tobacco and he had this agreement that one day a week he could be in the tobacco store and uh, so he was, if people would try to buy cigarettes and cigars, I guess, in that time from him, he would try to convince them not to do that because he said, well, actually, you, if you smoke this, you get cancer and everything like that. But he was, we would say now, canceled. So he was treated with hostility in the media. People were laughing at him. So he was telling people about this and uh, that wanted to buy cigarettes and they started to handing cigarettes to the camera crew and all the camera crew is starting to light uh, that so if we look at it now it's like well this is and people were smoking in front of children and everything like that but that's what so that's what the situation we are in right now like the social convention side like yeah but i want my meat or i want my car or this or that but yeah um, so he was saying like okay what we need to do now is is one of the things that extinction rebellion is doing is speak the truth and yeah exactly yeah it's the first amount yeah yeah and and no i could i completely agree well that's not surprising chris is one of my friends so <laughs> we talk about this stuff quite often and and i think what i often say in in in, in talks I, I i give talks and and speeches every now and then well mostly talks actually um is that you know there's this group of real climate science deniers you know which is you know the the right wing uh um uh conspiracy theories most mostly but then there is a much larger group of i think also climate science deniers but in in, in that sense that they deny the urgency or the severity of the situation and that is a group that is well i don't know the percentages i think 
maybe 10% of the population is a real climate science denier. It's quite small. It might be even less than, than 10%. But then there is a big, massive group of 90% or or 80 or 90 or whatever percent of people who believe that that you know climate is changing and it's causing harm and it's it will disrupt their lives, but have no idea, first of all, to what extent it's going to disrupt their lives. Uh, and secondly, how difficult the energy transition will be, even if we all agree on uh you know actually you know changing our energy system but but that means that that collectively we are climate science deniers because um we as we talked about in the last in the previous episode uh f- people who believe the earth is flat flat earthers they fly to conventions so yeah and, and people <laughs> who are anti-vax or who don't believe in corona when they have a heart attack they still go to their doctor yeah, exactly, so exactly. they select so we select a part so we select okay uh you know climate change is is real and it's uh we're certain about it and it's caused by humans and yeah we're we're uh very sure about this but we cannot do anything about it. But then you're so you're there are five scientific facts and you agree with four and one of them. Yeah, but we can't do anything about it. Or yeah, yeah we can do. Yeah. We're already doing enough. And, yeah. and what sci- what uh, Extinction Rebellion is demanding is too extreme. But actually, you're an actual climate scientist who is there because actually you're not even uh, demanding the extremist form that we would need to do to have a one and a half degree uh, society. Yeah, exactly. In in my opinion, the demands of of extinction rebellion are more in line with what the science is saying than than what the government is is doing and proposing. Yeah. So right now, so we are we're recording this podcast in 2023, and right now I have to watch my words, and I know uh, people still think XR is extreme, but let's see in a couple of years how, yeah, how that will yeah. uh, how that will be. Yeah. Exactly. So we'll so we'll have not a podcast in a few years, and we'll look back. Or we have another episode. I mean, I hope I will have another episode with you sooner because I really like talking to you. <laughs> I just wanted so the, the, the because it was just. I mean, I know it. People got hurt and everything like that, but from where I was sitting, looking at my computer, it was so beautiful yesterday. What happening? Because you were just saying, people are accepting climate change, but they're uh, denying the urgency. And then uh, yesterday, so Extinction Rebellion is for this was the sixth time that they block a part of the freeway, as you said, between uh, the government building and the climate uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate. And this is this particular part where the cars have to slow down. Actually, I I don't live in Den Haag anymore, but I I was there almost daily and uh, people, they slow down and, you know, and, and the last time I was there, I was there with my five-year-old daughter and I was looking down at, uh, you know, at you guys uh, from a safe distance. Actually, the yeah, police yeah. sent us away and, and yeah, they shouldn't yeah. have done that. They apologized for it later. But um, so there were a lot of people in support because the, the Dutch government also started to preemptively arrest protesters, yeah, which is unheard yeah, exactly. of, peaceful protesters. Yeah. yeah. But then what, yeah. what did the, what did the uh, government decide yesterday to put black fencing around that area yeah exactly. so that you wouldn't be it and it reminded me of those kind of black how do you say if you um censor something you have these black yeah. lines <laughs> so yeah. uh to not be able to see uh that part of the demonstration yeah uh, and and it was yeah, so okay. symbolic it, for me for like we don't want to face the science yeah, we don't want to face the protesters. We don't want to face the signs, and we just we just hope that everything will go away and the problem will solve itself. Yeah, and I think to 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 add to that, uh, so the police uh, used the water cannons against us yesterday, but they also used it against the legal protest next to us. Those were people who were standing on the sidewalk or pavement, just just you know looking, observing, supporting whatever you call it. Uh, and the pollution was actually using the water cannon against those people as well, which is, un- I mean, using it against us was unheard of. But that's like the next step to using them against people who are doing absolutely nothing illegal. That's 
Yeah, it's it's and and but and and I I I always emphasize that I mean this was for me this was quite an extreme day yesterday. I noticed it this morning. I slept for a long time. I had to walk in the uh, um um in the morning for about an hour to to empty my head. But what we're facing is nothing compared to to what people in the global south are facing. I mean, absolutely nothing. These people actually get killed for for standing up against uh, deforestation or, or climate destruction so um i always keep that in the back of my mind you know it's it 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 was cold and it was brutal and it was um dystopian almost but it's 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 still it's 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 still nothing compared to to what these people are facing what well, makes me very sad that uh the dutch government is using violence against the people who are there to point to the science that will keep my daughter safe. So yeah, exactly. I don't know really what to do about that, except to uh, yeah, speak to people like you and uh... yeah, yeah. So when is the next protest? Do you know that? I don't know. Um, I think they they will announce it within a few days. Um, so now everyone just needs to relax, need to you know, uh, uh talk about their experiences, maybe even process it. Uh. And then uh, I'm convinced we'll have another protest in in a month or two, um, because well, uh, we're growing fast. Uh, our demands are not met, so there's no there's no reason to stop. But so this this pro because the the protest end of January was already quite big because the government tried to arrest or they they arrested people and everything now. We also know that the government is looking up information. We also know that they use the water cannons and everything like that. So uh, the next protest might be even bigger, right? Yeah, that's that's what I assume. That's what I hope. Uh, um, I think about a year ago, the f that was the first protest. Dina, I'm even okay? I got here. Yeah, so the next protest will be probably even bigger and the one after that. And uh, Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. We're, we're, uh, yesterday was, I think, we, yeah, we don't know, but it was probably between three and 5,000 people, which is about two or three times more than last time. So we're, we're growing quite fast. Yeah, definitely. I would love to do a lot because my podcast is called Live from Plato's Cave and I'm kind of playing with live, you know, we live in Plato's Cave, but also that I'm broadcasting live from Plato's Cave. <laughs> so I would love to do actually a, a, a podcast from uh, from the demonstration, but I have to see if I can get a press card or something like that, because then I could come and uh, interview some of the people and, and just report on what is happening there. Because did you uh, you told me already you're a kind of you're a, like a, what I call a real scientist a beta guy, <laughs> but did you uh, read about Plato's cave and do, do you have anything to uh, say about it or were you too busy getting arrested? Uh, yeah, I tried to read a bit this morning. I, I was quite busy in the last couple of days, to to be honest. Um, so yeah, I, I I did read it a bit on on wikipedia this morning but uh, to be honest i'm no expert whatsoever uh, i'm more the physics and 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 chemistry type of of scientist or guy um so i i i know the uh yeah i know what plato's cave is but that that's more or less where my uh knowledge ends yeah well maybe i well I, what i can tell you is that it's about socrates uh, and socrates was living in ancient Greece and he was an activist because he was talking to people all the time and they didn't like it. So they sued him because he was breaking the law. And actually he knew he was breaking the law as well. <laughs> so I yeah. think he was one, he was actually, in, so I've, what I'm trying to say is you're in good company because it was someone who was not caring about the social conventions and, and the things about society. And even he was put to death uh, in the end, I hope that doesn't happen yeah. uh, here. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, because breaking the law is quite extreme, I think. So I think that's what what scares many people off. It's like, yeah, okay, I might be wanting to join Extinction Rebellion or something like that. But do you have to break the law? Because you know you're not allowed to be on the freeway, but you're going there anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so th there are actually many forms of protest, and uh, we with Extinction Baron are focusing mostly on civil disobedience. 
to well basically to shift the Overton window as I discussed uh, half an hour ago. But there there are many other forms of of activism I think, and most of them do not include getting arrested. Um, also within Extinction Rebellion, by the way, we we have media, we have um, we have uh, we have people who help us from a legal perspective. We have people who are actually waiting for us with cookies and tea when we um, uh, by the time we get out of jail, which is quite nice. If you've been in jail for a couple of hours and you're hungry and cold, um, that people are waiting for you, you know, and cheer you up and uh, etc. So there. Uh, the protest might seem unorganized from the outside, but it's actually highly organized. Uh, if if uh, if you're if you're in the thick of it, um, and there are many roles within Extinction Rebellion, but also in many other groups that do not involve any chance of getting arrested. Yeah, I heard there's um, even you know you if for instance you're a psychologist uh, that yeah. that there's uh, psychologists available in Extinction Rebellion because exactly. you have to. You willingly suffer violence by your government yeah. And, and yeah. getting ridiculed and getting yeah. arrested exactly. and everything like that. Yeah, that plus uh, mentally dealing with the climate crisis on a daily basis is also quite quite demanding. So it's it's those it's for those two uh, reasons, um, and yeah, that's very useful because doing activism, especially in the beginning, but 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 also later on, it's it's quite demanding both both physically and mentally. Uh, you know, most of us have a job uh, next to it or study or whatever, you know, and you do it in, in your spare time. Um, so yeah, it, it, it does take a lot of energy and, and mental um, strength as well to to do this kind of stuff. No. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, not just for this conversation, but f also for doing that and uh, for going on the streets and also for... Um, yeah, because I often say this is the loudest voice of science in our society today. Yeah. Um, because you're calling out for science, but you're also an actual scientist that is saying, okay, research papers, everything is not, it's not enough. And, and this is what yeah. is necessary. This is what we need to do right now. So yeah, thank you for that. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot. And thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. Go to livefromplatoscave.com for other episodes. And as I said in my intro, I asked Chris Julian to tell something about his experience of the protest. Hey Mario. So yeah, yesterday we were back on the highway with Extinction Rebellion in huge numbers. So that was incredibly heartening to be there with so many old and new uh, rebels in really a nice atmosphere. I was uh, involved in the preparation for the orchestra, so it was very sort of exciting and a bit tense for me to get all these people onto the highway safely and into the right space to to play together with other people to support them so it was really a magnificent start of the day that that all worked out so well and really gave immediately a certain nice atmosphere to the whole uh, action even though these big water cannons with the german polizei on them were looming above us so yes of course a lot of these actions are a bit double in the sense that it's uh, an elation to be there together and to stand up for what you believe in and for the future uh, and all of that uh, but then of course there's also police repression that happens in different ways every time yesterday was really quite heavy we were with so many people that the police couldn't really stop us nor arrest all of us so basically what they decided to do is try to chase us off the highway using violence that meant there was a lot of me with uh, shields and batons and these big water cannons and um, when we were trying to uh, stop the water cannons so to just stand in front of them the ma the riot police um, sort of ran into us tried to club us over and push us out in the process somebody next to me got hit when i called out that there was police violence to the journalists i also got smacked in the face so yes, long story short, it was really a great and successful action uh, and in that sense a lovely day, but also always a bit disheartening to have to sort of pay for that by encountering this police violence, having to sort of endure this yeah, really excessive operation by the state, which is really also just kind of a panic because they can't contain this um, civil disobedience, this force of civil disobedience anymore. Um, so they start to 
uh, increasingly act uh, repressively and uh, I guess we'll have to see where those forces lead in the coming uh, months.